Welcome everyone. It's a real delight today to be able to introduce Lena Happo for her PhD seminar. Lena first started in the lab with Mark Craig and myself in 2006, having been chosen by the uh, Undergraduate Research Opportunities Scheme, the Europe Scheme, as a potential uh, top science student and Europe certainly got it right for us. Uh, Lena continued to do an honours in our laboratory working on the same project that she was working on for her Europe and then stayed um, to continue work in her PhD with us. Uh, for her PhD she was funded by the Betty Miller PhD scholarship from the Leukaemia Foundation and uh, as you'll see in her talk today she has a, a very um, high grasp of her subject matter and I certainly look forward to hearing her today. Please join me in welcoming her. Thanks, Claire. I'm really sorry you had to wait all that time. We had some computer issues. Um, so today I'll be talking to you about one of my projects, which was to look at the impact of BH3-only proteins on the response of lymphomas to anti-cancer anti therapy. So just to start off, I'd like to introduce apoptosis. Uh, how do I get this? Oh, I'm sorry. How do I get this, um, the arrow to? Oh, that's all right. So apoptosis is a genetically programmed process for cell killing and it's important for the elimination of damaged and redundant cells from the body. Uh, there are two distinct mammalian apoptotic pathways. So the pathway over here is, did the, is the death receptor or the extrinsic apoptotic pathway. And this is triggered by the interaction between these death receptors and their ligands. Over here we have the intrinsic or the, or the mitochondrial apoptotic pathway which is triggered by the interaction, sorry, which is triggered by uh, various death stimuli, such as DNA damage, oncogenic stress, um, and also things like cytokine deprivation. Um, and for the purpose of this talk today, I'll be focusing on this intrinsic or the mitochondrial apoptotic pathway, which is regulated by the interaction between the BCL2 family of proteins. So defects in apoptosis have been shown to be major contributors to cancer development and has been shown to impair the response of tumour cells to anti-cancer therapy. So how does mitochondrial apoptosis occur? Well, as I mentioned before, this uh, pathway is regulated by the BCL2 protein family. And this protein family is subdivided into two. Firstly, the pro-survival subfamily here. And as the name would suggest, these promote cell survival. And also the pro-apoptotic subfamily, which is further subdivided into two. Firstly, the multi-BH domain uh, backs back and bock, and these are the critical effectors of mitochondrial apoptosis. And also this BH3-only um, protein subset, um, which, is, which shares with each other, and also the wider BCL2 family, only the single BH3 domain, which is critical for their killing capacity. And today I'll be focusing mainly on these BH3-only proteins, and in particular, Noxa, Puma, and BIM. So upon a stress stimulus, such as that caused by DNA damage inducing drugs, BH3-only proteins are activated, and these can then either bind to and sequester BCL2-like pro-survival proteins, allowing backs and back activation, or there have been some reports that these BH3-only proteins, well, some of these BH3-only proteins can directly activate backs and back. So the, the, the specifics of how these, BH, um, sorry, these proteins interact to initiate apoptosis is still unclear. However, what we do know is that upon activation of Bax and Bax, we get um, permeabilization of the mitochondrial outer membrane, cytochrome C release, and this is then recruited into the apoptosome to initiate caspase, cas the caspase cascade, which then culminates in cell destruction. So these BH3-only proteins have been shown um, to be critical for initiating apoptosis in response to various different stimuli. And much of this work has been done in non-transformed, so normal, healthy cells. Um, and these, this work has shown that um, BH3-only proteins act in a stimulus and cell type specific manner. For example, I've got cytokine deprivation as an example here. And this requires the action of BIM, Puma, and HRK. However, glucocorticoids, such as dexamethasone, um, requires the action of Puma, BIM, and BMF. More importantly for this talk, DNA damage such as that caused by chemotherapy drugs or gamma radiation or UV radiation requires um, the activation of P53, as you can see here, and this then upregulates uh, the bh 3 proteins Puma and Noxa. And as I mentioned before, most of this work has been done in non-transformed cells. And less is known about the role of BH3-only proteins in the initiation of apoptosis in tumour cells. 
So work done in David Wang's lab by Lin Chen showed that different BH3 only proteins um, show differential binding specificities for pro-survival BCL2 family members. As you can see here, BIM, Puma and TB, TBID are promiscuous binders. They're able to bind all the pro-survival BCL2-like family members. However, others that I've shown here have more selective binding capacities. B, B, BAD and BIC here can only bind BCL2, XL and BCLW, but not MCL1 and A1. Whereas NOXA, as you can see here, can only bind MCL1 and A1, but not BCL2, BCLXL and BCLW. Therefore, um, perhaps due to the ability of these potent BH3-only proteins to bind a wider array of these pro-survival BCL2 family members, they've been found to be more potent killers than their more selective counterparts. However, work has shown that combinations of these selective BH3-only proteins, such as the combination of BAD and NOXA, or BIC and NOXA, have been shown to increase killing capacity, presumably because together they can sequester all the pro-survival BCL2-like proteins in a cell. So many commonly used chemotherapy drugs, and I'll be talking mainly about cyclophosphamide and etoposide in my talk today, depend on their ability to evoke DNA damage for efficacy. So work in non-transformed cells have shown that DNA damage, such as that caused by these drugs, activate P53, as I sh showed you before, and that is then um, has been shown to induce the upregulation of the BH3-only proteins, Puma and Noxa, which are direct P53 targets. And although this has been shown in non-transformed cells, this has not definitively been um, demonstrated in tumour cells. So the questions that arose were whether the P53 targets, Noxa and Puma, have a role in suppressing tumour genesis, and whether they have a role in the response of tumour cells to DNA damaging chemotherapy. So in order to do this, we uh, decided to use the ENUMIC transgenic mouse model, which is the mouse model that was developed in our division here at WEHI. In this model, uh, the CMIC oncogene is linked to the immunoglobulin heavy chain gene enhancer, EMU, and this overexpression of CMIC um, in B cells causes abnormal increased cycling and therefore accumulation of pre-B and pro-B cells. And the acquisition of additional oncogenic uh, mutations can lead to um, tumours. So this is a great model to work with as these lymphomas arise with relatively short latency. Um, these mice usually get sick um, because of uh, tumours within about one year of age and um, these lymphomas also arise with high penetrance. Uh, the lymphoma burden can also be easily monitored by lymph node and spleen palpation. You can see here in a representative emumic transgenic mouse, you can see these enlarged lymph nodes and also usually an enlarged spleen which you can see on the side here. And from these organs, we can harvest large numbers of tumour cells and we can store them. And um, these lymphomas can then be transplanted into uh, non-irrated immune competent mice for later analysis, such as um, drug response analysis. So there's significant pressure for the P19 ARF pathway to uh, be compromised in this enumic transgenic mouse model. In normal healthy cells, P53 is kept at relatively low levels um, by the action of the E3 ubiquitin ligase MDM2, which can target P53 for proteasomal degradation. However, upon um, oncogenic stress, such as that caused by MIC overexpression in this model, we get activation of P19-ARF, which then inhibits the activity of MDM2 to stabilise P53. So as you can imagine, it's very favourable for tumours to um, disable this, this pathway. And in fact, 30 to 50% of all emumic lymphomas have this defect. And this can lead to accelerated lymphomogenesis and also impair drug response. And because we're interested in the response of emumic lymphoma cells to DNA damaging juicing drugs, it was really important for us to differentiate between those lymphomas with wild type P53 function versus those with defective P53 function. And so we were really careful to always be working with those lymphomas with wild type P53 function for all our drug response analyses. So a little while ago, um, Eva Mikulak in the lab showed that Puma is indeed a suppressor of MIC-induced lymphomogenesis. And as you can see here in this Kaplan-Meier, in this black line here, which represents the survival of conventional emumic transgenic mice, 
And you can see that one loss of one <coughs> loss of one allele of puma in this light blue line here doesn't alter the onset of lymphomas. However, when we lose two alleles of puma, you can see we see significant acceleration of lymphomagenesis, but it's not as severe as when we lose p53. Now, if we look at the other p53 target, Noxa. In this, in this green line here, you can see again, we see no acceleration in tumorigenesis. However, when we lose Noxa and one allele of Puma in this pink line, we again see significant acceleration of um, tumorigenesis. And we see something, something similar when all of Noxa and Puma are lost. And again, I'd just like to point out that when we compare these, this pink and gray line with the red line here, you can see that um, loss of Noxa and Puma does not result in acceleration as severe as what we see when p53 is deficient. So Puma and Noxa seem to cooperate in the suppression of MIC-induced lymphomagenesis. So we decided to look at the response of anemic lymphomas to DNA damaging drugs in vitro. And what we um, typically do is we take lymphoma cells from sick anemic transgenic mice. These cells are then put into cell culture and stable lymphoma cell lines are generated, and this usually takes about two weeks. Uh, these stable cell lines are then treated with a topicide and then harvested at any given time point, stained with an X and 5 and PI, and then I fax them to see uh, levels of apoptosis. And you can see here um, in this black line, which represents the response of conventional anemic uh, lymphoma cell lines in vitro to a topicide treatment, you can see that these lymphoma cell lines are quite sensitive to a topicide induced killing. Therefore, DNA damage inducing drugs, such as a topicide, um, can efficiently cause apoptosis. <coughs> However, we can significantly reduce the cell death here by loss of p53, as you can see in this red line here, which means that p53 seems to be required in this response. When we overexpress BCL2 in these amumic lymphoma cell lines, as you can see in this blue line here, we get, uh, again, significant reduction in cell death compared to the black line here. And this would indicate that this apoptosis is occurring via the mitochondrial apoptotic pathway, presumably via the activation of these BH3 only proteins. And I'd just like to point out that overexpression of BCL2 seems to protect protect anumic lymphoma cells from metoposide induced killing more so than lo loss of p53. And this suggested that perhaps there was some sort of um, p53 independent pathway here to activate the mitochondrial apoptotic pathway following DNA damage inducing drug treatment. A little bit further downstream, when we look at treating, when we treated anumic lymphoma cell lines with a topicide, and also the caspase inhibitor QVD to prevent, uh, we could prevent cell death once again. And um, this would indicate that this apoptotic pathway requires the action of the caspase cascade. So work in non-transformed cells have shown that Puma and to a lesser extent Noxa are P53 dependent mediators of DNA damage induced apoptosis. So this is published data, and um, as you can see here, when you look at those uh, thymocytes here we're looking at from wild-type mice, these are killed in response to gamma radiation in vivo, and we see the, a similar thing in those uh, thymocytes taken from NOx and knockout mice. We see good killing. However, when we look over here at those uh, thymocytes obtained from P53 knockout mice, we see good protection from gamma radiation-induced killing. And when we look at this, those cells from human knockout mice, you can see that these cells are, are protected, although these cells are not as well protected as those from P53 knockout mice. Now, if we look at those double knockouts, so noxopuma double knockout cells, you can see that um, it's very interesting that you can see these cells show protection to gamma radiation induced killing, and this protection is similar to what we see when P53 is lost. Therefore, it seems that at least in thymocytes, Noxa and Puma seem to account for most, if not all, of the P53 dependent apoptosis induced by DNA damage. So my question was whether to find out whether there was a role of Noxa and Puma in the response of MIC-induced lymphomas to DNA damage-induced apoptosis. So when we treat conventional anemic lymphoma cell lines uh, with one microgram per mil of etoposide for three hours, you can see here that we see robust induction of Noxa and Puma mRNA, so this is qPCR data, and we don't see this robust induction in those anemic lymphoma cell lines that have mutations in the p53 pathway. 
And I can show you this at the protein level for Puma. In those cells with wild type P53 function, we see nice induction of P53 protein following atopicide treatment. And we can also see simultaneous induction of Puma protein. And we don't see this in those emumic lymphoma cell lines that have a mutation in the P53 pathway. I'm not able to show you similar protein data for uh, NOXA protein induction because we don't currently have any good uh, mouse uh, NOXA West and blot antibodies. Um, sorry about the resolution here. Um, so when we look at the response of emumic lymphoma cell lines that are lacking these BH3 only proteins to atopicide in vitro, again I'll just remind you this is this black line here represents the response of conventional emumic lymphoma cell lines, and again, they're quite sensitive to atopicide-induced killing in vitro. When we lose P53, as you would expect here, we see high-level high resistance to atopicide-induced killing. When we lose one of the P53 targets, NOXA, we see uh, <coughs> sensitivity to atopicide, which is comparable to what we see um, in the conventional emumic lymphoma cell lines. However, when we lose Puma in this light blue line here, you can see that there is mid-level resistance to atopicide, which again is not as significant to the, as the resistance seen when P53 is lost. So Puma but not Noxa seem to be required for atopicide-induced apoptosis in these emumic lymphoma cell lines. So now if we look at this dark blue line here, which represents the response of emumic noxapuma double knockout lymphoma cell lines, you can see that these cell lines show mid-level resistance to atopicide, which is similar to what we see when Puma is lost on its own. And again, the combined loss of noxa and Puma does not result in uh, resistance as severe as in P53 deficiency. And this suggested to us that perhaps another pro-apoptotic BH3-only protein is contributing to this response in addition to Puma and Noxa. So we also did um, look at the response of emumic lymphomas in vivo, this time to another DNA-damaging drug, cyclophosphamide. And here what we routinely do is we take lymph nodes or spleen from sick emumic transgenic mice. These cells are then transplanted into multiple C57 black 6 mice. And then when these mice get sick and their lymph nodes and spleen become palpable, which usually occurs about 12 days following um, injection, we then treat these mice with one dose of carrier or cyclophosphamide and then monitor their survival until relapse. Just before I go on to show you my results, I'd just like to mention that there have been reports that tumor sub, there is tumor subtype dependent impact on BH3 only gene deficiency on tumor development. Um, and this has been published before, and loss of puma or loss of BIM has been shown to accelerate the development of surface IgM positive B cell, B cell lymphomas in emumic transgenic mice. However, it doesn't seem to um, alter the onset of surface IgM negative pre-B lymphomas in these emumic transgenic mice. So we wondered whether the in vivo drug response is also dependent on lymphoma subtype. And so we decided to analyse um, our treatment data according to uh, tumour subtype. So if we now focus on the response of surface IgM positive B cell lymphomas of different genotypes, you can see very clearly in this red line here and here, you can see that these represent emumic P53 knockout lymphomas. And again, similar to what we saw in vitro, these cells are very resistant to cyclophosphamide-induced killing, and these mice relapse very quickly following treatment with cyclophosphamide. Um, it, this, these black lines represent the response of conventional emumic lymphomas to cyclophosphamide. And you can see that loss of NOXA in this orange line and Puma in this light blue line here does not alter the response of um, these lymphoma cell lines to cyclophosphamide. However, when we now focus on the response of surface IgM negative pre-B lymphomas in vivo, once again, if we look at the red lines, emumic P53 knockout uh, lymphomas are very resistant to cyclophosphamide. However, in this case, when we look at this light blue line, which represents the emumic Puma knockout lymphomas, you can see that here, different to here, we see mid-level resistance to cyclophosphamide. And this mirrors what we saw in vitro. But um, the resistance we see here as a result of Puma loss is not as severe as what we see in P53 deficiency. 
Okay, so now if we go on to look at the responsive anemic noxipuma double knockout lymphomas in the dark blue lines here and here, you can see that um, we see mid-level resistance to cyclophosphamide at 200 milligrams per kilogram of cyclophosphamide here. And this resistance is no more severe than when we lost Puma alone. And again, this is not as severe as when P53 is lost. However, interestingly, at the maximum tolerated dose, which is 300 milligrams per kilogram of cyclophosphamide, we actually see increased sensitivity at this dose of these Noxopuma double knockout lymphomas. And there is a significant difference between the response of these Noxopuma double knockout lymphomas and Puma single knockout lymphomas. And this unexpected drug sensitivity at this dose suggested to us once again that perhaps there's a compensatory effect of another BH3 only protein which is involved in this response. And we thought perhaps BIM, the other potent BH3 only protein, is involved. However, um, P there is no identified P53 binding site in the BIM gene sequence. But BIM deficiency has been shown to accelerate emumic lymphomogenesis. And Philippe has also shown that BIM knockout thymocytes show some resistance, modest but significant resistant to, resistance to gamma radiation. So what about in our emumic lymphoma cell lines? So when we treat our emumic lymphoma cell lines with um, a topocyte in vitro, so one micrograms per millivit topocyte, in the presence of QVD, which I mentioned before as a caspase inhibitor, we saw some induction of BIM mRNA following six hours of treatment with a topocyte. And this induction of um, BIM mRNA was not as apparent in those anumic lymphoma cell lines lacking P53. And I'd just like to mention here that when I showed you the upregulation of Noxer and Puma mRNA following a topocyte treatment, this occurred at an earlier time point at three hours following a topocyte treatment. So it appears as if this increase in BIM mRNA is occurring at a later time point following DNA damage, so six hours here. So then what we did was we generated emumic BIM knockout lymphoma cell lines in vitro and we also treated these cell lines with a topocyte. And you can see in this green line here that these emumic BIM knockout lymphoma cell lines are just as sensitive as control emumic lymphoma cell lines. In fact, we looked at the loss of other BH3 only proteins such as BMF, BAD, BIC and BID. And um, I can tell you that no single BH3 only deficient cell lines show any resistance to a topocide except for the emumic puma knockout lymphoma cell lines that I showed you before showed mid-level resistance to a topocide. We also looked at the response of emumic BIM knockout lymphomas in vivo. And as you can see here, we're always comparing the black, which, which represents the conventional emumic lymphomas, and the green, which represents the emumic BIM knockout lymphomas. There's no difference to um, the sensitivity to cyclophosphamide in the surface IgM negative pre-B lymphomas. However, when we look at the response of surface IgM positive um, B cell lymphomas, and if we just focus on those mice that were treated with 200 milligrams per kilogram of cyclophosphamide in these dotted lines here, you can see that although this is not statistically significant, there is some trend towards poorer survival in those mice that are bearing emumic BIM knockout lymphomas compared to those bearing conventional emumic lymphomas. So BIM may be contributing to cyclophosphamide-induced killing of lymphoma cells in vivo. So in vitro, we analysed over 80 independent lymphoma cell lines. In vivo, 9 to 22 independent lymphomas per genotype. 2 to 11 recipient mice per treatment arm. That's more than 300 independently derived primary lymphomas of different genotypes and immunophenotypes. And just in summary, after all of this work, um, in vitro in response to etoposide in these emumic lymphoma cell lines, I showed you that we saw an increase in the induction of Noxa and Puma transcriptionally and also at the protein level. And this seemed to occur at three hours following a topocide treatment and also appeared to be P53 dependent. I also showed you that we saw some induction in BIM mRNA and this occurred at a slightly later time point than Puma and Noxa at six hours following treatment. And this seemed to be also be P53 dependent, but we think that perhaps this is indirectly. I also showed you that there was normal response in all single BH3 deficient cell lines except for those lacking Puma, which showed mid-level resistance. 
And just in summary here, in vitro, um, these conventional control emumic lymphoma cell lines showed no resistance to atopicide. Puma knockout and noxapuma double knockout lymphoma cell lines showed mid-level resistance to atopicide, but this was not as severe as loss of P53. In vitro, in, uh, sorry, in vivo in response to cyclophosphamide, um, in the surface IgM negative pre-B lymphomas at 200 milligrams per kilogram of cyclophosphamide, I showed you that again, the control emumic lymphomas showed no resistance to cyclophosphamide. And just like in the in vitro data, Puma knockout and Noxapuma double knockout lymphomas showed mid-level resistance to cyclophosphamide. And again, this was not as, they were not as resistant as the P53 knockout lymphomas. At 300 milligrams per, oh, something's happened here. 300 milligrams per kilogram, again, the Puma knockout lymphomas <coughs> showed mid-level resistance. However, surprisingly here, the Noxapuma double knockout emumic lymphomas showed sensitivity to cyclophosphamide-induced um, killing, which was similar to what we saw in the control emumic lymphomas. So after all of this work, we can conclude that emumic Noxapuma double knockout lymphomas are definitely less protected than emumic P53 knockout lymphomas. So in light of this, we decided to uh, look further into the involvement of the other potent BH3-only protein, BIM, in this response. And we did this both in vitro and in vivo. Um, and what we basically did in vitro, which I'll go through first, is we generated stable emumic lymphoma cell lines. So they were either Puma knockout or Noxapuma double knockout emumic lymphoma cell lines. These were then retrovirally transduced with either the SH-BIM expression vector or an SH control vector. These cells were then uh, selected for by pyromycin and also by fact sorting for GFP positive cells. And then we looked at the response of these lymphoma cell lines um, to atopicide in vitro. And following retroviral in, uh, transduction, we looked at the efficiency of BIM knockdown. And as you can see here in these different lymphoma cell lines of different genotypes, in each case, in those lymphoma cell lines that were transduced with the SH-BIM expression vector, we see nice down regulation of BIM protein level when we compare it to those lymphoma cell lines that were either transduced with the empty GFP vector or the SH control vector. So now if we look at the response of a representative emumic noxapuma double knockout lymphoma cell line with um, BIM knockdown, firstly, if we look at these lines here, the green line and the blue line, which represent the response of those noxapuma double knockout lymphoma cell lines that were transduced with either the, the empty GFP vector or the SH um, control vector, you can see that here we see mid-level resistance to atopicide, which was similar to what we saw in, uh, in those emumic noxapuma double knockout lymphomas that were not transduced with any expression vectors. And now if we look at this pink line, which represents uh, those lymphoma cell lines that were transduced with the SH-BIM expression vector, you can see we have this um, profound increase in resistance following BIM knockdown. Oh, sorry. So I did this for um, various emumic and emumic puma knockout and emumic noxapuma double knockout lymphoma cell lines. And as you can see here, if we look at the percentage of um, increase in the reduction of apoptosis, you can see that BIM knockdown seems to confer the most profound resistance to atopicide in emumic noxapuma double knockout lymphomas. So we also did complementary experiments in vivo, and for this we basically took primary emumic lymphoma cells, so these are lymphoma cells that have not been cultured, they've been taken straight from the mouse. These cells were again retrovirally transduced with either the SH BIM expression vector or the SH control vector. And these cells were transplanted into mice, and then when these mice became sick, we treated with one dose of cyclophosphamide and then looked at their survival following treatment. Again, we looked at the efficiency of BIM knockdown, and you can see here that in those lymphomas that were transduced with the SH BIM vector, we get much less BIM protein than in those uh, control infected, vectors, uh, infected lymphomas. So now if we look at the survival of those um, mice that were bearing these tumours and we looked at three independent emumic noxapuma double knockout lymphomas and this bl these black lines here, this is the Kaplan-Meier curve, these black lines represent the, the survival of those mice that were um, bearing tumours, these emumic noxapuma double knockout lymphomas uh, that were transduced with the uh, control GFP vector 
And when we compare this survival to the red lines here, which represents the survival of those mice that were transduced with the SH BIM vector, you can see in each of these cases very clearly that there is poorer survival of mice bearing lymphomas with BIM knockdown. So in summary here, following BIM knockdown in vitro, I showed you that we see increased resistance in emumic noxipuma double knockout lymphoma cell lines. And following BIM knockdown in vivo, I showed you that there is rapid relapse of these mice post-treatment. So BIM seems to be contributing to the killing of emumic lymphoma cells, particularly in the absence of noxorum puma. So we wondered whether we would observe something similar um, with complete loss of BIM, because up until now we'd only been looking at knocking down BIM levels. Unfortunately, we can't breed for emumic noxa puma BIM triple knockout mice, or even emumic puma BIM double knockout mice, due to the early penetrance of those mice with genotypes that are required for breeding. Therefore, I generated Noxum Huma BIM triple knockout mice, so these are not emumic. These are viable and fertile. I harvested E13 fetal liver cells, and these cells were retrovirally transduced with a semic IRES GFP vector and transplanted back into mice to generate tumours. So more specifically, what I did was I took fetal liver cells from Noxipumabim triple knockout mice, also Pumabim double knockout mice, and P53 knockout mice. These cells were then retrovirally transduced with this CMEC IRES GFP vector. Then these fetal liver cells were co-cultured with OP9 cells to enhance differentiation into the B cell lineage. And following this incubation, these fetal liver cells were injected into lethally irradiated Li 5.1 mice. And what we typically see is that these mice get sick about six to ten weeks following reconstitution. Uh, they show increased um, enlarged spleen and also enlarged lymph nodes, and these are then harvested. I take uh, lymphoma cells and establish lymphoma cell lines, and once these um, cell lines become stable, I look at their immunophenotype. So we want them to be CD19 positive B cell um, lymphomas, and these can be either surface IgM negative, mixed or surface IgM positive. And we use these um, lymphoma cell lines for drug response analyses in vitro. So this is what we saw. So when we treat these MIC-driven PumaBIM double knockout um, lymphoma cell lines, and each one of these green lines represents an independent lymphoma cell line, you can see that these show uh, mid-level resistance to atopicide, which is quite similar to what we saw in the emu mic puma knockout lymphoma cell lines that I showed you before. If we look at those MIC-driven P53 knockout lymphoma cell lines, as you would expect, these lymphoma cell lines are highly resistant to atopicide-induced killing in vitro. And most surprisingly, the MIC-driven noxipumabim triple knockout lymphoma cell lines showed resistance um, to atopicide-induced killing, which was just as severe as what we saw when P53 was lost. So in order to double check that these noxipumabim triple knockout lymphoma cell lines were not showing similar resistance to atopicide induced killing as P53 knockout lymphoma cell lines just because they had some sort of defect in the P53 pathway. We then looked to see, oh I'm sorry, I missed this, that's okay. Um, so we then looked to see that these cell lines had functional P53. And um, as you can see here, we did this firstly by looking at the levels of P53 and P19-ARF protein. Um, and I'd just like to mention that these Western blot antibodies don't detect endogenous P53 or endogenous P19 ARF expression. So any bands that you see represent overexpression or stabilised uh, protein levels. So firstly, if we look at these MIC-driven P53 knockout lymphoma cell lines, as you would expect, we see no P53 protein as these lack P53. And um, when we look at P19 ARF protein levels, these show um, overexpression of P19-ARF, and this is something that we would expect given this a schematic that I showed you before, where P53 normally negatively regulates P5 P19-ARF. So without P53, we should get overexpression of P19-ARF without this negative regulation. So that all seems to be fine. In these MIC-driven PumaBIM double knockout lymphoma cell lines, we see no stabilised P53, and we see no overexpression of P19-ARF. So we think that perhaps everything is working correctly. And again, we see the same thing in those Noxipuma BIM triple knockout lymphoma cell lines. I also, um, I also 
treated these amumic pum sorry mic driven pumabim double knockout and mic driven noxapumabim triple knockout lymphoma cell lines with a topicide and then looked at the induction of p53 protein following treatment and you can see here that we see nice induction of p53 protein following three hours of treatment with a topicide in these two independent pumabim double knockout lymphomas and also in the uh, two independent noxapumabim triple knockout mic driven lymphoma cell lines I also looked at the uh, mRNA induction of two known P53 target genes, P21 and MDM2 by qPCR following treatment with a topicide. And you can see here, as you would expect, in the MIC-driven P53 knockout lymphoma cell lines, we see no induction in these um, genes. However, in the Pumabim double knockout and the Noxapumabim triple knockout, we see nice induction of these uh, target genes. Just to be absolutely sure, we also sequenced the P53 in these lymphoma cell lines, and the sequencing uh, <coughs> revealed no mutations in P53. So it seems as if the dramatic resistance that we see in those meat driven noxapumabim triple knockout lymphoma cell lines is due to the loss of these BH3 only proteins alone and not due to defective P53 function. So you may be wondering why this green line here, which represents the pumabim double knockout lymphoma cell lines, show only mid-level resistance to atopicide induced killing in vitro, given that we're taking out two of these um, potent BH3 only proteins. And we thought perhaps this was because NOXA is still available to work in concert with these other selective BH3 only proteins to induce killing in these lymphoma cell lines. And indeed, when we look at uh, the induction of NOXA mRNA in these MIC-driven Pumabim double knockout lymphoma cell lines, you can see we see nice induction of NOXA mRNA. This is six hours following treatment with a topicide, and we don't see this induction in those MIT-driven lymphoma cell lines lacking P53. However, when I treated these MIT-driven P53 knockout lymphoma cell lines for a longer time with um, a topicide in vitro, you can see here, 24 hours post-treatment, we see some induction of NOXA mRNA and also some induction of BIM mRNA. So there seems to be some sort of P53 independent upregulation of NOXA and BIM post 24 hours of atopicide treatment. So given that BIM has been, as I've shown you, seems to be playing a role in the response of MIT-driven lymphomas to DNA damage, we decided to look um, in more detail at the, P53, the role of P53 independent BIM induction in this response. And to do this, I generated P53 BIM double knockout fetal liver cells. These were then um, transduced with, again, the CMIC IRES GFP vector and then treated with uh, etoposide in vitro. And you can see that their response in black here. And if we compare the response of these P53 BIM <coughs> double knockout lymphoma cell lines to the P53 knockout lymphoma cell lines, you can see at 24 hours following etoposide treatment, both at 0.2 micrograms per mil and one microgram per mil of atopicide, we see um, an, a, a further enhancing of the resistance following loss of um, BIM on top of P53. So it seems that P53 independent induction of BIM can also contribute to atopicide induced killing of these mic driven lymphoma cell lines. So just quickly, what I've shown you here is that P53 independent induction of BIM and NOXA mRNA seems to occur 24 hours following treatment with atopicide. MIC-driven P53 BIM double knockout lymphoma cell lines are more resistant than, uh, than MIC-driven P53 knockout lymphoma cell lines, again following uh, 24 hours post-treatment. So, um, and I'd just like to remind you of this graph here that I showed you very early on in my talk. And here I showed you that BCL2 overexpression in emu MIC lymphoma cell lines, shown in this blue line here, um, caused more resistance than loss of P53. So P53 independent apoptosis must also contribute to DNA damage induced killing of these mic driven lymphomas. So what I've shown you today is that there is a critical role for Puma, Noxa and also unexpectedly BIM in the DNA damaging drug induced apoptosis of mic driven lymphoma cells. DNA damage inducing drugs can activate P53, which then upregulates its direct BH3 only proteins, Puma and Noxa, 
I've also shown you that these DNA damage inducing drugs may also be uh, upregulating NOXA independent of P53. I've also shown you today that BIM can also kill, um, particularly in the context of where Puma and NOXA are lost. And this seems to be occurring both in P53 dependent, although probably indirect, or P53 independent manner to cause apoptosis. So this work highlights the importance of NOXA, Puma and BIM status in predicting the response of tumours to DNA damaging chemotherapy. So just to finish up, I'd like to thank um, my supervisors, Claire and Andreas. They've been really good um, wee high parents to me, always looking out for me. I'd like to thank Mark Cragg, who basically got me started up in the lab. He taught me everything really, all the experimental procedures I needed to know for this um, project. I'd also like to um, thank Suzanne for um, giving me great advice all the time at lab meetings and for supporting this project. I'd like to thank um, the members of the, the Corey Lab, in particular Cass and Kirstine, who always seem to calm me down when things went wrong. Um, I'd like to thank Eva Mikulak, who crossed the Mick mice with the Puma knockout and Noxa Puma double knockout and also the Noxa knockout mice to produce these tumours for me to work with. I'd like to thank uh, some of the members of the Stressor Lab, who have basically been great friends as well as sharing reagents <clears throat> and um, advice. I'd like to thank Jerry for his advice during um, divisional seminars, seminars, David for a lot of reagents, Philippe for a lot of mouse issues, and um, also Ruth for helping out with all of my ongoing PhD assessments. Um, I'd like to thank the rest of the MGC division for making it such a great place to come into work every day. Uh, Andy Villinger provided us with the uh, EMUMIC BMF knockout lymphomas. Ricky Johnston provided the EMUMIC uh, BID knockout lymphomas. And Sebi uh, provided us with the OP9 lymphomas, uh, sorry, OP9 cell lines. Uh, Ross provided some uh, short hairpin vectors for some work that went into this project, but I didn't show you today. Belinda and Gordon did um, the, the bioinformatics analysis on the, all the in vivo treatment data, so that was great. Uh, a big thanks to the mouse facilities who, there was a lot of mouse work involved here. Um, Jason for doing all of my bleeds, the fax facilities for sorting my cells, and also Bruno and Carly for doing so much genotyping for my mice. Dennis and Tom for um, irradiating my, uh, my reconstituted mice. Thanks. Oh, and I'm also funded by the Wikimedia Foundation. Thank you for an excellent seminar, and I'll open it up to questions. Now I can see who's asking questions. David? So, do you think any of the response is mediated by changes in the level of anti Members rather than changes in the BH3 only? So um, I think it's, it's due to the changes in the BH3 only, but also because we're, we're, there's a lot of loss of the BH3 only proteins if we take out Noxa, Puma, and BIM. It's interesting that in these um, Noxa, Puma, BIM triple knockout MIC driven lymphoma cell lines, we actually see lower levels of pro survival proteins. So that would go against what you would expect because these lymphoma cell lines are more resistant. However, they have lower levels of pro-survivals. And that's probably because you probably don't need as many of these pro-survival proteins to counteract the loss of the BH3 only protein, to counteract the levels of BH3 only proteins. But yeah, we don't see an increase in pro-survivals. We have looked at that. Okay, so I'm sorry, how uh, unique a model is uh, cancer or chemogenesis caused by mica expression? How generalizable do you think it's going to be? Um, how, what is the incidence of tumours that have no, mic overexpression? Just saying, the P53 independent and all that sort of stuff. Is that restricted to cancers driven by excessive mic, or is it going to be more generalisable? Oh, a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of cancers in response to chemotherapy do um, go via the the P53 dependent pathway, it's not just um, MIC driven tumours. Although MIC driven tumours obviously are more predisposed to apoptosis as but well. The P53 independent upregulation of BIM, is that something that's predicated by MIC expression? P53 upregulation P53 of BIM. P53 independent upregulation of expression of BIM, which you found? Yes. 
is that something that's dependent on over No. Anything? No. Because um, there's been some work in uh, thymic lymphomas as well, and where there is no MIC overexpression, and we see um, <coughs> um, an involvement of BIM in a P53 independent manner. So when you take out BIM on top of P53 in these thymic lymphomas, which are not driven by MIC overexpression, we see a decrease in resistance as well. Other questions? How is the knowledge of the level of BIM puma and uh, NOXA are going to help you uh, find out whether the cells are going to respond to uh, etoposide or not, since all these three genes are involved or upregulated by the treatment. So the treatment, the, before the treatment, how the, what's expressed before the treatment is going to help you know whether they are going to, the tumors are going to answer. Not quite sure what you're asking, sorry. Mm -hmm. Well, that was your conclusion. You said that the, that the knowledge of uh, being human and uh, NOXA status in, the, in your yep. info, in uh, your yep. lymphoma so is going to predict how they are going to uh, to respond. Mm -hmm. How so? Because basically, if a mouse or a patient or somebody comes in and <laughs> obviously <laughs> and they have these tumours. And obviously we don't do it often now, but you can sequence these tumours, have a look at um, whether there's something going on in Puma, BIM and um, Noxa, and then we can What's basically what, say... What are you going to test? Deletions. So, okay, it's not the question. Then. Silencing. How, how, how frequent is the deletion of Puma, uh, Noxa and BIM in the lymphoma? So basically there, have, there has been reports of BIM being silenced and also deleted, so it might be prom promoter hypermethylation or things like that. There's also been reports of NOXA being um, silenced in hem hematological malignancies and there's also um, been deletions and also silencing of tumour as well. So it does happen. We don't know whether they happen in combination because no one's really looked at that. I guess we would have to look at that at the protein level and obviously you don't get enough protein from getting biopsies from people. So no one's really looked at that. People have obviously looked by microarrays, um, so that's looking at RNA levels. People have looked at DNA level, but maybe you don't see that. It might be post-transcriptional. So no one's really looked at it that, so I don't think I can tell you the answer, but... No. Other really questions? Mm -hmm. um, do you have any idea which on the pathway so there has been reports that, um, so just focusing on BIM first, we think that perhaps there, there are several targets, I mean, sorry, several things that might be regulating BIM independent of P53 and we think maybe it might be um, some of the FOXO transcriptional factors such as FOXO3A and FOXO1, and basically they've been shown to um, upregulate BIM in response to DNA damage. There's also been a report that P53 can negatively regulate um, FOXO, so perhaps this means that in the absence of P53, this pathway becomes more important. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that we've thought about is CHOP. So CHOP is something that is um, upregulated in response to DNA damage. It's been shown that um, the induction of CHOP is more robust in the, in the presence of P53. And um, there's papers that have come from Andreas's lab that have shown that CHOP can induce BIM um, in response to ER stress, so that's another pathway. As, um, as for NOXA, there's been reports of IRFs that um, induce, induce NOXA independent of P53, and also I think other Things like P73 have also been shown to upregulate so um, NOXA. Sorry? There's not one pathway that is able to induce both at the same time, but there would be multiple pathways being activated with the drug. Yeah, but yep. I don't really yep. know. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. So it was just um, my answer to Gabby just then. So um, yeah, it would be probably via these other transcriptional regulators, Boxo or CHOP or something else.
So we're just right on time. Is there one last question before we draw to a close? Yeah, well, please join me in thanking Lena for an excellent. <laughs>